Hello, everybody. Welcome. Good morning. It is a lovely fall morning here in Washington, D.C. Uh, my name is Sam Abrams. I'm a visiting scholar here at the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research. I'm also a professor at Sarah Lawrence College. Uh, I teach politics uh, up in Westchester, New York. Uh, it is always a treat to come down here uh, and uh, talk to so many people. And uh, today, it's a real treat uh, to welcome Clay Risen. Uh, to AEI, uh, who's here to talk about the crowded hour, Theodore Roosevelt, the Rough Riders, and the dawn of the American century. You know, I was thinking about how do I introduce Clay, and uh, I, I looked online at some of your other talks, and you know, people like to talk about the fact that he's a graduate of the University of Chicago, which in and of itself is impressive given its in, incredibly challenging uh, humanities and great books sort of program. Uh, they like to talk about uh, you know, your, your prolific uh, writing career, talking about the 1960s and Martin Luther King. Uh, incidentally, um, Clay and I first met after uh, he was gracious enough to come to my undergraduate course uh, that I was teaching about LBJ. I had just read his book on the Great Society. And uh, to my shock, he wrote back very quickly and said, sure, I'll meet uh, your students. So I was very, very grateful. Uh, and a lot of people talk about the fact that he's a world-class editor with uh, the New York Times. Uh, do we know, by the way, did the White House get the paper this morning, or is it already? Uh, oh, yeah. I don't know. They move fast. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, Good I, question. Yeah, I look forward to trying to figure <laughs> that out. <laughs> but um, I wanted to actually highlight uh, two other uh, aspects of, of, of Clay that I, I think are pretty uh, remarkable. Uh, and, and the first is that, uh, like yours truly, uh, he is an Eagle Scout. And uh, on top of that, he is a dad. And I've had the pleasure of uh, watching Clay uh, get deeply involved with his community, his school, uh, and his kids. And here at AEI, we care very, very much about, how do we, about building community and how do we build community. And we talk about families and all the various local institutions that enable communities th to thrive. And uh, you are an exemplar of that. I'm sorry if that you. makes you uncomfortable, but uh, I, I have long been uh, very, very impressed. and, and uh, uh, you have been quite a role model for me on, on that end, so thank you for being that. Thank you. Uh, and an another uh, facet of uh, Clay's life that I I'd like to mention is that, uh, as far as I know, you are not a professor anymore. No. 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 Um, but I think you should be. Oh, well, thank you. And uh, for those of you who are, you <laughs> and for those of you who are lucky enough to actually visit Clay's home, you walk in. And in addition to there being lots of bottles of liquor around, and, and I want to be very clear, uh, I do not believe you have a drinking problem at all. Uh, for those of you who don't know, he's uh, one of uh, our nation's leading uh, writers on uh, the spirits world. So uh, bottles are sent to you almost daily, if, if I recall correctly. Yeah, too many. Um, I have plenty of students who are over there, <laughs> 21, who would happily uh, take those off yeah. your hands. Um, you walk into his apartment, and it looks and smells like a library. That is the ultimate compliment I can give mm -hmm. someone. He has uh, floor to ceiling bookshelves, and they're everywhere, even in the bedroom. This is something, by the way, that I, as a professor, have dreamt about having. Uh, I don't think I would stay married uh, if I tried to install bookshelves in uh, my bedroom. Wow, don't but, give my uh, wife any ideas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, I, I mention this because it's not, they're not there for show. Uh, Clay has. Uh, I would presume either read almost all of them or is deeply familiar with, with, with most of them. And I think that's what has made Clay a remarkable <coughs> editor and a remarkable writer. Uh, when I've struggled uh, with writing or I've had some ideas and have tried to put pieces together and have been, uh, and I've sent them to you and you've given me some feedback, you always ask me one or two questions or you may make just a very short statement and say, have you thought about it this way or that way? And I always get angry because I realize I missed something. I didn't see it right. And boy, thinking about it that way makes this much clearer, makes the argument crisper, makes my points uh, tighter. And the piece goes from sort of blah to, oh, this is kind of cool. Uh, and and you know, that gift uh, is not something we find very often. And uh, that's why I would say, uh, as a, a, you know, from a professorial standpoint, I mean, you could easily walk into any history department, uh, I, I think teach modern history, modern American history, and be just a world-class mentor to, to our students. So uh, again, that's a slightly Thank different you. introduction. But uh, it, it's certainly something that uh, I, I think is, is absolutely true. Uh, and I am very grateful, uh, personally, uh, for, for your, your feedback. And I know my students over the years have been very grateful for that feedback uh, as well. Um, it's another reason I was very excited when The Crowded Hour first uh, came out. I wanted to read it. 
uh, because I obviously love everything uh, Clay writes. Uh, I highly recommend you pick it up. Uh, Kramer Books around the corner incidentally has extra copies on hand uh, and I think we have it available for order here uh, as well. So what I thought we would do today is talk just briefly about the book, uh, why you wrote it, why now. Uh, you know, obviously you could write about many things. Why, why at this moment in time? Uh, you know, who are the Rough Riders, uh, and so on. Uh, then uh, Clay will give a slight, a short presentation, and then I thought we would turn it over uh, to the audience to have a conversation. We're a small enough group that I think we can do that. Uh, the professor in me wants to do that. Uh, and I know we have some descendants of Rough Riders uh, in the room, and I think that would be very cool to hear some stories and get some background uh, as well. Again, we here at AI like to build community, and I think this is a good chance to, to certainly do that. Um, so let me, let me start by just saying, you know, Teddy Roosevelt is, is, is a figure that I have long admired. I, I teach courses on the presidency regularly. Uh, I, I often teach TR. Uh, there is a commission that's being formed to actually establish the first Teddy Roosevelt Library out in uh, North Dakota. I'm personally hoping to get involved with that. I, I presume you'll want to as well. Uh, it's going to be hard to get to, which is, I think, the only uh, downside yeah, yeah. Uh, to it. Uh, it's on the far south uh, west. It's where he had his ranch. Yes, yeah. which is obviously fitting, but, which is fitting, but uh, yeah. if the goal is to communicate with the public, that may be a little challenging. It's not like going to the uh, FDR library where you just hop on the red line in Boston and, and, and can get there. But, uh, you know, so TR is a, is a revered figure in some circles in New York. Uh, in, in some circles, he's not, actually. And we can talk about the statue uh, controversy at mm -hmm. the American Museum of Natural History in a few. But uh, incidentally, um, the American Political Science Association regularly polls political scientists over who they f admire the most in terms of the presidency. C-SPAN regularly polls historians asking the same sort of question. And uh, to my surprise, historians and political scientists actually agreed on this. Uh, both lists, the most recent lists, uh, rank TR as number four. Uh, a quick cursory uh, look on biography shows that over 25,000 biographies exist on TR in some form or another. So I guess the question is, um, why do we need another book about TR? And I know, <laughs> incidentally, that the book is broader than TR. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's, uh, first of all, thank you. And thank you for that introduction. And, and to AI for having me. This is a real, uh, a real treat in such a beautiful space. Uh, and thank you all for coming out. Um, you know, I, uh, part of it was to not write a TR biography. Uh, one thing that fascinated me about this story was that so often the story of the Rough Riders is told as kind of a chapter in TR's life, uh, maybe this sort of incidental fun side of him. Uh, maybe they link it into kind of you know, telling the story of his rise to national prominence, but, but it's really encapsulated within his biography. And to me, what is striking about the story is how he is central to it, but not the only thing. And in fact, the Rough Rider story uh, as sort of a, you know, kind of a, a, a one part or, or maybe a sort of a, the central part of the Spanish-American War story uh, at this turning point in American history, it you know, begs for a discussion, a, a book that goes beyond just the biography. So it, there is a biographical thread through the book. I think that there are important things. It's certainly true that this was a very important moment in TR's life. Uh, but what I wanted to do is pull out, you know, other characters, other aspects of that story that <clears throat> that often get lost when when we focus it as uh, this is the Rough Rider story. It is about Teddy Roosevelt. So speaking about getting lost, um, we've had this on the schedule for a while, and I visited a number of schools uh, around the country this fall, <coughs> and I, I was curious uh, about who the Rough Riders are, and I've asked students casually in no scientific way, but. Do you know who they are? And, and most people don't know. And then you ask them about the Spanish-American War, uh, and they don't know. Mm -hmm. um, why have we forgotten these folks? I mean, this story, the story of this motley crew, and I get to finally use that word, yeah. uh, I think, correctly, uh, this is a fascinating group of people. Why do we not know about them? Yeah, so... And who are they? Uh, right. <laughs> so, uh, so the Rough Riders were, there was a, a regiment of volunteer uh, it was a cavalry regiment, a uh, volunteer cavalry regiment that was commissioned or created uh, by the declaration of war against Spain. So this wasn't something that existed beforehand. It was created specifically to fight this war uh, because we didn't have a large enough army. And it was very much 
the, uh, the creation of Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, it was his idea. He was the assistant secretary of the Navy. He kind of had a, uh, a, you know, a way into the ear of McKinley and uh, the Secretary of War, Russell Alger, and very easily persuaded them that they needed to do more. Uh, they needed some kind of quick reaction force that could, I mean, it's kind of a crazy story. Uh, when you think about it, you know, would this guy, Teddy Roosevelt, 38 years old, assistant secretary of the Navy, wants to go out and get a bunch of cowboys and uh, college athletes and whatever else, uh, and give them some cursory training and go off to war. And part of why I think this is, uh, th so it's this kind of crazy story, but what's important and why I think this war is so important is that something like that could happen. And it's telling about where the country was at a time when we were growing rapidly. Uh, there was no question that in the 20th century, America was going to be uh, a dominant, if not the dominant economic force in the world, uh, maybe the dominant political force. I mean, there was uh, you know, the ways people talked about the United States was in some ways the way that we until recently talked about China. I think now we talk about China in a different vein. Uh, but until recently, uh, it was very similar. And, and yet, it was a country that was wholly unprepared for that role. And so I think one of the things that's important about the Spanish-American War is that it was this turning point. It was this moment when America started to grapple with the requirements and the, uh, the sense of responsibility that we had as an emerging global power. Why has it been forgotten? Well, you know, people like war stories, and it's a short war. Uh, and outside of the Rough Riders, there aren't that many, you know, heroic stories that come out of it. George Dewey's defeat of the Spanish fleet at Manila is maybe the only other thing that comes out of this war. Um, it is, uh, it's a confusing war because there are a lot of myths around it on the one hand. Um, the idea that it was wholly the creation of William Randolph Hearst is not true, but it has become this, this myth. Uh, on the other hand, it's a very problematic war because it's something that we got into for, uh, for a variety of reasons, um, but, but ended up becoming a, especially in the Philippines, which we never really wanted to capture, but did, incidentally, it turned into this pretty brutal and, and this brutal colonial uh, war to put down uh, an uprising by the Filipinos against the United States. And so it's, so it's morally ambiguous. And so I think oftentimes it's just, it's hard to tell this story in a way that uh, you, you can tell a story about Vietnam that is encapsulated as just a tragedy, right? Or, you know, a moral uh, disaster. You can tell the opposite story about World War II. Now we know that these are not the way that those, you know, the, the, those are much more complicated wars. Uh, but we tell the story that way. But think about how little World War I as big as it was, remain how much purchase that has on the American mind, American memory today, uh, that's a very complicated story and doesn't really have the kind of resonance that, uh, that those other wars do. So I think the Spanish-American War has those two things going against it, just the, uh, the, the briefness, uh, the brevity of the war and, and this kind of moral ambiguity. I wonder if actually we need to speak with our historians and our historical associations about saying, you know, I understand that these are problems, this is complicated, but American history is complicated. And I wonder if we're doing a disservice, at least on the faculty side, by not teaching all that much about this in uh, our survey courses. I've taken a number of American yeah. history survey courses and uh, never taught one as a non-historian, but this stuff is not emphasized. But the ambiguity, the, co the, the, compli you know, the complexity yeah. is important. It, it mirrors, as, as, as you've written about elsewhere, uh, quite a bit of uh, the ambiguity we deal with today when we enter uh, certain places yeah, as well. So it's, it's striking you know, there are you, lessons. Yeah, when I was doing the research for the book and kind of looking at uh, this, the historiography around the war, um, there, there isn't that much, and military history generally has been uh, you know, run out of the academy. So we just don't have a lot of military history. There are some fine military histories uh, about the Spanish-American War, but they're largely out, not outdated, but they're old. Uh, but even the diplomatic histories, the economic histories, uh, a lot of that, there was a, a lot of it written up through the 60s and then really petered off. And so you just don't have people writing uh, about this period in general. Um, 
you know, that said, I wouldn't be surprised if over the next couple of decades we start to see a resurgence. There certainly is a renewed interest uh, for obvious reasons in the Gilded Age and the period that, uh, let's say, the decades that led up to uh, 1898. And you know, there's some really interesting scholarship being done these days around that era. And so it might follow that people then start to say, well, okay, what's the next step? Where did the United States uh, go from you know, this kind of post-reconstruction, gilded age moment, what was the next phase? It'll be interesting to watch. Yeah, the professor in me is thinking we really do need to confront this because the ambiguities of all of our, you know, behavior well, now yeah, and I think the Spanish-American yeah. War is, is important for, I mean, one of the things that really jumped out at me was how immediately important it was as a conflict for domestic reasons and how you know, there are all these different ways in which the conflicts of the late 19th century in the United States were seen as resolvable by this war. So you could just take um, sectional reconciliation. And one thing we, uh, we forget today is that you know, the North and the South did not reunify after the Civil War. Uh, politically, they did uh, in, in only the, uh, the stalest uh, terms. You know, yes, we had one Congress. We had people coming from the southern states eventually to sit in Congress. We had a sense that it was uh, a unified government uh, at the federal level. But really, the federal government had almost no presence in the South. And the animosities between the two, and that was after Reconstruction, obviously, uh, and the animosities between the two sections were pervasive and you know, deep and continuous up through the end of the 19th century. And one of the things that I was struck by was how overtly, how, how adamant journalists, politicians, all kinds of observers were that the war would resolve this, right? That by having an external enemy uh, that the United States, North and South, could unify around, that that would bring us together. There's a photo in the book, um, if anyone ever picks it up. Uh, I, I just had to highlight this because it showed I think on a lot of levels, what's going on. Um, where is it? Uh, do, do, do. Oh, wait. Yes, well, it's too small to see. But it was, it's a staged photo with a, uh, a Confederate veteran and a Union veteran staring at each other sort of very angrily. But in the middle, there's a young woman dressed up as Cuban liberty. And she's <laughs> bringing them together. And I found poems, I found these really terrible sort of short stories, all these, but it was part of the imagination in the United States that we now have this reason to come together. And so, you know, you could pick any labor relations, uh, race. I mean, one of Jim Crow was, was coming to, uh, to the South in a big way in 1898. And there's a whole subtext through, through my book, but certainly through that period of how the North by coming to the South and engaging with the South, sort of, you had almost a second uh, death knell for Reconstruction, this sort of agreement uh, that the North would look the other way over Jim Crow, and the war was not incidental to that. So all these things are going on that you know, really have nothing to do with the actual war fighting and the actual goals of the war. It's more like, let's just have a war, and it will solve all these problems. Good. I mean, you even write that, uh, you know, T.R. smiled, uh, quote, when uh, war with Spain finally arrived. And I think a lot of politicians certainly know that. Uh, I, I've heard a very similar line from quite a few uh, political leaders who regularly say, we may not want war, but boy, there's some effects that are very, very powerful oh, here. And it sounds, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, for those of uh, us in the room who have not read the book uh, yet, I was wondering, what is the crowded hour? It's a oh, cool word. Yeah. So, phrase. so the crowded hour, um, I mean, the deep history is that it's a line from a poem that was written by a, uh, an officer in the Seven Years' War, so a British officer. And he had been serving in, um, he, he fought in Belgium, actually. And uh, he wrote this poem, and it's kind of the celebration of of war, and, and I'm going to get the quote wrong, but there's a couplet, and it says something like, uh, you know, one crowded hour of uh, glorious strife is worth an age without a name, right? So celebrating kind of, uh, just celebrating war and the, the experience of battle. And uh, the poem and the poet uh, 
uh, have been forgotten, except that uh, Sir Walter Scott loved this poet and loved this poem. And then, uh, so through him, he was beloved by the kind of Roosevelt generation uh, all through the 19th century. But particularly these uh, kids, they're not kids, but the children of the Civil War generation, uh, these people who did not experience the Civil War, but heard all these stories and saw it as a glorious experience. And so TR, TR you know, I think, multiple on multiple time, occasions, you know, sort of wished that he had been old enough to go off to war. He was a very small child at the time. But uh, so, so you have this glorification of, of war. And, and so this, this poem, this, at least this couplet, which was used, uh, which Scott used as the uh, epigraph for one of, a chapter in one of his books, was very well known at the time. And so Roosevelt, when he later reflected on uh, his charge up, uh, up Kettle Hill and then up San Juan Hill in the, in the Battle of San Juan Heights, uh, he, he called that his crowded hour. And for him, what it meant was, you know, this is, this is the moment that both is what all of my life has been leading up to, and it's the moment from which the next phase of my life begins. And he meant that in, in political terms, right? His sort of his political uh, fortunes changed dramatically after that. Uh, but also just that it, it brought together so much of the things that personally he had been looking for, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, very, very uh, almost feral kind of desire on his part for, for bloodshed and violence on the battlefield. Uh, but, but also, I think, um, and I'm not sure he would even feel this way, but I, I do, that, that it, it, because it brought that to an end, it opened up a new era, a new era, uh, new phase of maturity in his thinking, and you can certainly see it in his writing before and after the war. So, so, so I call the book The Crowded Hour for that reason, but I also think that for a lot of the reasons that I just explained uh, er, to, in answer to your previous question, it was also a crowded hour for the United States. It was this moment where a whole lot of things that we were trying to answer as a country were resolved, and a whole bunch of new questions were opened. And those were questions that we dealt with throughout the 20th century. So a lot of people, and, and you make this very clear, and you just did mention that this may have been the phase shift of, uh, of his life from you know, um, crazy guy into big time leader, uh, where he shifted from a military worldview to sort of a global worldview. Uh, what, you know, how, what made him such a great leader? Uh, we're regularly, you know, I regularly teach courses on leadership. Uh, and, and philosophy of leadership, what was it, you know, how would he view leadership uh, and, and what sort of uh, is necessary to, to become a great leader? You know, we, you spent some time hinting at he had very clear philosophies about what he wanted to do and how he wanted to execute yeah. those. Yeah, I think that one of the things, so he had not had a lot, we think of him as this great leader as president, and he was, uh, very effective. And, uh, and certainly we think of him in the Rough Rider sense of, uh, this uh, this leader, uh, but up until that point, he had not really spent a lot of time as a leader. You know, he had run his ranch uh, as an on again, off again absentee rancher. Uh, so when he was there, he did lead men around. Um, he had clearly shown some talents as a leader, but he had also spent most of his career as kind of a maverick, uh, often really at odds with different aspects of. Uh, the Republican Party that he was he was at war with. Uh, he considered himself a very staunch Republican, but at the same time, uh, in conflict, uh, there were emerging tensions in the party. And as as you probably know, he eventually split with the party and created uh, a, a third party in in 1912. Sorry, that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> um, and uh, so so he, so there was. So he was sort of on the outs in a lot of ways. And you know, he'd gone through all these career changes through uh, the 1880s and the 1890s. He had done all sorts of things. Uh, by the end of the 1890s, bef before the war, he considered his, uh, he worried that, his, that life had sort of passed him on, uh, passed him by. He was 38 years old. He was the assistant secretary of the Navy, but you know, had also been kind of kicked around a few years of this job, a few years of that job. And what I think is significant about this moment, this really you know, much less than a year period in his life, is that it allowed him to bring so many of the different strands of potential, uh, of leadership potential, uh, together into one experience. So I think one thing is that you know, his willingness to sacrifice himself, 
and to, de to deny himself, which was always part of his persona, uh, really sort of pushing himself physically and mentally to the max. Uh, he was able to bring that to a leadership role in a way that made the men respect him. So one of the stories is that when he got to San Antonio, where they were training, they, uh, the hotel, the, the, the main hotel in town, uh, still one of the nice hotels, the Manger Hotel, uh, offered him uh, a free room, free, free room and board. They said, look, you know, you're Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to go out there with those men. Uh, you know, they're all dirty cowboys. Uh, you can go train with them, come back, have a nice hot bath, have a good meal, sleep here, and you'll be good. He said, absolutely not. I'm, I'm going to go out with my men, and whatever they do, I do. And you know, if they sleep on the ground, I'll sleep on the ground. If they march 12 miles in the 100-degree heat, I'm going to march 12 miles. And he did it every inch of the way. And the men who had been kind of skeptical of this guy, you know, they'd heard stories, but... Um, you know, he was a little shorter than they thought he was. He had a high-pitched voice. He was, <laughs> you know, kind of looked like a dandy. He wore thick glasses. Uh, this kind of demonstration of self-denial proved to be very effective. And when you think about what does it mean to be a leader, one of the things that makes an effective leader is a willingness to do whatever you ask someone else to do, right, not to just stand back. So I think that, and then that carried throughout the war. He was that way on uh, the, the, the train ride from San Antonio to Tampa. He even gave, they had given him a room uh, you know, in, in one of the trains, and he gave it up for, the sick, for men who got sick along the way. Uh, in Tampa, in, on the boat to Cuba, throughout the experience in Cuba, which was hellish, aside from it being a war, men, most of men uh, who died in the conflict died of, of disease and malnutrition. And he was there with them the whole time. So, so I think that's important. And you know, that comes to bear, especially in the fight itself. I mean, we, uh, he is both praised and derided for you know, charging up San Juan Hill or Kettle Hill and uh, in this sort of uh, you know, hyper-masculine sense. But, but as a leader, that's incredibly important, right, to have seen, to have this guy who in the face of Spanish fire, uh, said, no, I'm going to run. I'm going to lead the men up the hill. I'm going to run up the hill. In fact, he was on a horse to begin with, uh, and then eventually he got off the horse. He said, you know, I'm going to go. And that is what made it happen. That's what made this so effective uh, as a charge, was that the leader, the guy in charge, didn't just tell them to go up. He led them up there. And I think that this, in so many other ways, um, and, and I would say one more thing is that uh, not only as effective as he was getting out in front and showing the men what to do, he was not someone who assumed he knew everything. And this is another effective uh, aspect, and maybe the opposite of that is is both a willingness. I'd say it's uh, it's both a willingness to delegate to the people that you serve under you, who you know are more effective uh, than you are at a certain task, and then to learn from them. So one of the things Roosevelt did was when he got to San Antonio, he very quickly figured out who are the effective men in this regiment uh, who have military experience, who maybe have uh, just something about them that lends themselves to be leaders. And he put them in positions where they would be more effective than, say, just toadies who might do whatever he wanted. So he had men who, you know, were willing to just go off on, you know, not go off on their own, but really take charge of their own aspects of, of the regiment. And then he learned from them. So he made all kinds of mistakes. You know, he was not, a, he had no experience uh, in military training at all, but certainly in, in drill formation and any kind. And so he relied on these men, not just to do it, but to teach him. And multiple, many of the men who later wrote memoirs or had just recollections of, of Roosevelt, one of the things that they remembered about him was that especially in San Antonio, after everyone was in bed, after all the, the soldiers were in bed and all the officers had done their uh, debriefing, Roosevelt would be up late at night reading manuals, going through, figuring out, and then the next morning quizzing them, quizzing the veterans. Uh, okay, the book says to do this. Now, what happens if this happens? What do we do? And, and then he used those tactics, a lot of the very specific things that he was asking about in, on the battlefield in Cuba. Uh, 
And so, and people saw this and they, they understood that here was a leader who did not assume that because he was a leader, he was uh, all-knowing, all-powerful. Here was somebody who was very willing to learn from and, uh, and correct when he made mistakes. And, and I think that that marks uh, a very effective leader. So. Sounds uh, very similar to some of the recent work that uh, General Mattis has actually been putting out, too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, remarkably. Yeah. Let me ask you one final question before we turn it over yeah. to just a quick presentation. Okay. And I, I guess that question is, um, so I live in New York uh, for the most part, um, where uh, there's an awful lot of controversy over the public record of you know, what sort of historical markers we have. Uh, tomorrow, incidentally, I'm taking my students to the Statue of Liberty in, in, in Ellis Island. Uh, as I'm sure you know, there used to be a statue of King George uh, down there, which is, was uh, you know, immediately toppled. I, I wish that actually still uh, existed. It would be a pretty mm. uh, remarkable reminder of our past. I would uh, find it quite profound. Uh, in front of the Natural History Museum uh, on Central Park West, there's a statue by James Earl Fraser uh, from 1939. And it's been repeatedly criticized. Uh, a sociologist at the University of Vermont uh, basically said that on the left uh, hand side, so it has um, TR on a horse, uh, looking very proud. On the left hand side is a Native American standing by the horse, and on the right is a African American. Uh, and uh, the sociologist said this is meant to evoke white supremacy. Um, I don't really know if I agree with that. I think uh, all historical characters uh, and figures are, are complex. But uh, as a teacher, I regularly find myself in, in a world of extremes uh, where people try to shut down the complexity. Um, this story is complex. The legacy of the Rough Riders is complex. The story of the Spanish-American War is complex. Um, how do we talk about this? Uh, and, and how do we balance these various legacies to get the important history and the important narrative out? Well, I think it's it's... First of all, it's, it's things like this. It's, I mean, it's both, hopefully, in a small way, a, a book like this, but just talking about this, and then, and then events like this. Uh, it is, look, these are always going to be processes. Uh, you know, it's always going to be a process of working through, because history is not, first of all, history is not fixed, obviously. But it's also very much filtered through our current experience. So if you look at the, the kind of the history of Theodore Roosevelt as a historical, fi as a figure, not his life history, but his, the history of him and the memory of him, uh, it goes like this. And it's fascinating. And it's exactly, you can explain exactly why uh, he is popular at one moment and uh, unpopular at another. And, and of course, although, although as you, said earlier, he is consistently popular, uh, but it's uh, the waxing and the waning sure. relative to uh, you know, the rises and falls that, uh, that I think it says a lot about where we are as a country. And one of the things I think is really striking is that, you know, and this just says how complex TR is, a, is as a figure, is that even as people are going after that statue, uh, who is Elizabeth Warren's favorite president? In fact, so... <laughs> So beloved by Elizabeth Warren that she would love, she would want him as her running mate. She mm -hmm. has said, and it's Theodore Roosevelt, and and there's a good reason because here's a guy who, as president, probably did more, uh, more to move the country in a progressive uh, direction, and and not even. I mean, as president, you could say, well, you know, he's sort of doesn't. He stands in the shadow of his distant relative, Franklin Roosevelt, or even LBJ. But as a figure, uh, the, uh, the, the person who did more than really anybody else to introduce the idea of progressive, uh, active government action, uh, and, and especially after his presidency, the, uh, the, the links that he went to advocate for uh, progressive legislation, progressive ideas about conservation, about labor laws, about women's uh, uh, about suffrage, he was one of the leading advocates of suffrage in the 19. He was, you know, probably the as far as uh, prominent political figures. He stood alone in advocating for women's suffrage in 1912. Um, you know, that's not to say he's not very complicated. There are some uh, very deeply troubling uh, themes about race that run through a lot of his thinking about progressivism. And so those things need to be unpacked. He is not someone that we can import whole hog and say, wow, I wish Theodore Roosevelt were alive today exactly the way he was back then. It's just not the way um, 
you know, we, we have to examine the, the warts and all of every figure. But, but I think that it's very telling that he is, uh, it shows how complicated he is that we're having all these discussions about him uh, right now in different veins. But, but I also think that we are going to see um, a, some sort of a, a resurgence of Roosevelt, I think because uh, on par, you know, on balance, he did advocate a vision for progressive politics that, and, and, and progressive politics in a practical way that a lot of people on the, on the left, I think, w not all, um, certainly not the, the far left, but I think a lot of people on the on the left will start to uh, start to look to as 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 a as a lighthouse. Uh, also, the fact that you know for no other reason, here's a guy who uh, who was a Republican who broke with his party and was willing to come out and say, you know, I love what the Republican Party stood for, what I think it stands for, but the Republican Party today uh, does not stand for those things, and so I'm not going to be a part of it. And you know, I think there are a lot of people on the right as well as the left who look at that and say, God, why can't we have more people like that today? <laughs> uh, so, so there are these, I mean, and so that's the weird thing about history, right, is that we can say on the one hand, look, history, if historical figures, people in the past are just too complicated to ever uh, serve as a model, right? And we can't be presentist. We can't kind of selectively pick and choose. And yet, at the same time, we can't help but look at a figure like Roosevelt and say, I am inspired, or I am, uh, it, it makes me think, or something like that. So there's, there's this usefulness of history uh, that, um, that we can't get away from, and, and we shouldn't. And I think Roosevelt is a great example of, of how we grapple with that. Great answer. Okay. <laughs> Coming from a university professor, I would, uh, I would take that as a high compliment. And as an honorary one. So, um, so uh, why don't I turn it over to you to make a okay. few remarks? Would you like to sit or stand, um, whatever is I would you? love to just sit. Okay. So if that's okay, if that's sure. okay with you all, I'd, I'd, this is a very nice looking podium and I don't want to uh, demean it, but I think I'll just sit because I, no, I got up very early this morning. Um, Anyway, what I, what I wanted to talk about uh, today, and, and this is sort of, I was sort of trying to think about, well, what do I want to say at AI? Um, and since it is uh, a, an estimable policy research institute, I thought I would say something a little, um, uh, a little more on the policy side, a little more, uh, you know, maybe some few, uh, fewer sort of fun stories about the Rough Riders and more about what I think is two things that are really important about this story. Uh, that the Rough Riders illustrate, but ultimately don't totally encapsulate. Uh, and by this story, I mean the story of the Spanish-American War. And as they pertain to uh, military history in America, and, and, or the history of the military. And when, when we think about the war, or if we do at all, one thing that we don't think about is how we almost lost in, in a number of ways. And we almost lost because we were not it all ready for this war. This was a war that, like I said, everyone wanted for a variety of reasons, and yet no one thought about what it would mean to actually go to war. So, and, and the war changed this situation in two ways, uh, and I'll talk about each of them. The first is uh, a kind of just the bare bones, we did not have an army, essentially, in 1898. When the Civil War ended in 1865, the Union Army, so just the Union Army, had a million men under arms. Uh, five million men had served in the Union Army through the course of the Civil War. And so we had this massive force that was almost immediately deconstructed. And uh, within, a, within a year, it was down to 100,000. Uh, within a decade, more or less, it was down to 28,000. Uh, 2,000 officers, 26,000 soldiers. And most of them were spread around the country. Uh, some, at least at first, were deployed along the Mexican border uh, to kind of guard against um, where there were some concerns, particularly when France still controlled Mexico. Uh, but there were concerns about uh, what Mexico might do in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. Uh, we were fighting. We were fighting. Uh, the military was deployed uh, in the Indian Wars and then ultimately to, uh, to kind of uh, settle 
the West. So there are all these uses of the military. But, but over time, even those kind of uh, became less important. And so we had these soldiers who were often spent decades uh, off in you know, sparsely populated parts of the country uh, in small garrisons. Maybe if, maybe if they were lucky, uh, there were a few hundred soldiers. Very rarely did they ever meet any other soldiers from any other regiments or any other types of regiments. So cavalry never trained with infantry, never trained with artillery. There was no sense of this is an army that goes off and fights a war. Uh, it's almost more like a constabulary. And in fact, one of the ways that the US, that the military was used uh, later in the century was to put down labor unrest. And needless to say, that made the army not very popular and uh, even less popular than it was uh, to begin with. And so we get to 1898 and McKinley declared war. And there was this idea really that drew out of uh, a very longstanding tradition in the United States that we would just rise up like we had during the Revolutionary War, like in 1812, 1848. Uh, I'm from Tennessee, and if everyone ever wonders why they're called the Volunteers, why the UT football team is called, why Tennessee is the volunteer state, is because so many men from Tennessee volunteered to fight Mexico in the Mexican-American War. That was the tradition, the Civil War. All these things kind of were part of this, this idea that Americans don't have a large army. We are an army. We build an army when we need one. And we go off and fight, and then people come back, and they go back uh, to what they were doing. Anything else would be antithetical to what American liberty and freedom are all about. Now, Roosevelt had spent much of eight, the 1890s pushing against this idea. And there were many people like him uh, who kind of fell under the broad umbrella of jingoism. Um, but one element of jingoism was preparedness and saying, look, we can't we can't be the country we want to be and not have a military that at least is ready to fight. Even if it's not as big as what Europe has, it needs to be ready. And the Spanish-American War hit, and we were not ready. So not only did we not have nearly enough men to go fight, but we didn't have a bureaucracy to fight. Up until then, there were essentially two aspects of the military, of the army, uh, that were in tension. There was the Secretary of the War, the Secretary of War, and a bureaucracy underneath him that, you know, more or less kind of ran the uh, uh, logistics side, uh, ordinance, uh, ran uh, provisions and the quartermaster, uh, who made sure that all the men, at least in theory, had uniforms. That was totally separate from the commanding general who was in charge of the actual men. And both of those separately reported to the president. And for a variety of reasons, they didn't necessarily overlap. And the president would have a commanding general who served under multiple presidents. Uh, there were only a few commanding generals, starting with Grant through Sheridan, Sher or Sherman Sheridan, um, on up through Nelson Miles, who was the commanding general during the Spanish-American War. And they were often at odds with the political appointees who held the secretary position. And so this was all, in a way, designed to undermine the military, to make the military less efficient, and therefore less of a threat to American liberty. And as you can imagine, Southern politicians in particular loved this. They loved the idea that the military, that the, the Union Army, uh, which is now, in theory, their army, uh, would never be able to do what it had done during the Civil War. And, or under Reconstruction. And so it was constantly being undermined. And we get to the war, we get to 1898, and the plan was, once again, we will build an army. And that would mean training, that would mean uh, you know, provisioning them with, with supplies, with uniforms and guns. Most of these men were supposed to come through state-level militias, which were by then really just more like uh, social clubs in a lot of places, really unable to train men to get them ready. Uh, they also had, it was up to them whether they would even send men to serve in the war. So uh, one of the reasons why the Rough Riders were created was to kind of serve in the breach. There were a few other regiments that were along with them uh, that were created under, they were volunteers, but they were created under federal auspices 
and with this idea that they would select men, that they wouldn't just be made up of men who are sent because they happen to be members of this pseudo-social club in, um, uh, in their states. And so all of this happened. And, oh, the other thing was we didn't really have the means to move the men uh, to Cuba. Uh, this was our first truly foreign war in the sense that we had to go overseas, or first true overseas war. Now, granted, it's the Florida Straits, so it's 70 miles. It's not really overseas. But, but we had to get the men to Cuba, and we didn't have ships. There was no merchant marine. There was no reserve force. Uh, we had to lease ships, most of which were coal ships and uh, cattle ships that were retrofitted uh, with bunks so the men could move, uh, so they could move men. And we weren't able to move the entire force that we had ready in Florida because we didn't have enough ships. Anyway, all of this is to say that we were setting ourselves up for defeat. And it is amazing that we nevertheless won. Uh, the fact that we were fighting a debilitated Spanish force in Cuba, which was really, I would say, particularly at some of the leadership levels, looking for an excuse to lose. Uh, they wanted to be defeated so they could say honorably, we are getting out of Cuba. Uh, had we been fighting almost anybody else, including probably the Mexican army, uh, many of the armies in South America were much stronger and better than ours in 1898, um, we would have lost. And so this lesson was taken, uh, taken very seriously after the war. There, were, there was a series of hearings, uh, high-profile hearings, uh, into the mismanagement of the war. Uh, a lot of people lost their jobs over it. Uh, it was a pretty significant public grappling with, uh, with where the United States was. And then very quickly, uh, a series of reforms put in place by uh, Laihu Root, who replaced Russell Alger as Secretary of War. Russell Alger was not at all uh, capable of, of doing anything other than sort of caretaker, uh, being caretaker for the Army. And so Alger, um, you know, was shuffled out after the war. And Root, who was a, uh, didn't have any military experience, but was a very effective Wall Street lawyer. Uh, he was uh, Roosevelt's lawyer and uh, was one of the men who, had, one of the side stories. Roosevelt, when he ran for governor of New York after, the, after he came back from Cuba in 1898, um, failed to... It sort of slipped by him, slipped by people that he was not actually a resident of New York State. Uh, he had moved his residency to Washington, and so technically he could not run for governor. Um, and Root was such a good lawyer that he just figured out a way uh, to, uh, through by hook and by crook, to uh, get Roosevelt on the ballot nevertheless. And so, uh, so McKinley appointed uh, Root as the successor and McKinley was assassinated, Roosevelt came in and kept Root on and then supported Root's efforts to completely restructure the American army. And so the first thing he did uh, was to create a, a clear hierarchy. So no more commanding general, there would be uh, a general with a staff, which today we, uh, has, has evolved into the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, but a, um, you know, a staff structure uh, really bringing a level of professionalism through the ranks, not just to the West Point graduates and to some of the senior officers, but all the way through, creating a new, uh, what, what today we know of as the National Guard system. And so a, a system that was not just kind of 50 different small armies that kind of did their own thing, but was very much a, a contract between the federal government and the federal army and states where the states would get money and they would get support, and yet they would also have to adhere to certain standards, and they would have to uh, have a clear line of communication with the federal government so that when the federal government needed them, they couldn't stand in the way and just say, no, we don't, we don't really want to be part of that war uh, or that mission. And throughout the 20th century, uh, particularly at, at the domestic level, we can see uh, instances where federal government was able to use state-level militaries uh, very effectively. Think of uh, the Little Rock crisis in, uh, uh, regarding school desegregation or uh, the University of Alabama uh, 
desegregation where troops uh, under the control of segregationist governors were federalized and were told, now you are serving at uh, the behest of the president. You're going to do what the president tells you to do. That would have been impossible under the previous system. And so all of these ways uh, completely changed what the American military did. We also dramatically increased the size of the army. So from 26,000, 28,000 up to a little over 100,000 as the peacetime army. And the idea was really to have uh, something of a, uh, let's say, a compromise between those people who still believed that America was served best when it had the tiniest army possible and just kind of relied on the, uh, the vigor, patriotic vigor of its citizenry and those who, like Roosevelt, believed that, no, we need a really powerful army if we're going to be a powerful country. So we have this kind of in-between, this kind of compromise that Root worked out that was uh, a strong core that could very easily inflate as necessary. And you know that had to be worked out. There were certainly kinks through it. And throughout the early part of the 20th century, there were always times when uh, America wanted to go to war when the beginning of World War I, for example, where we kind of got to the point of declaration of war and realized we're not ready for this. But we were much more ready and we were much more uh, capable of working through that challenge than we would have been before the Spanish-American War. And so that w the war is very important in that regard because it forced a, a recognition that the old ways that had defined the 19th century uh, we're no longer applicable, we're no longer viable, and we needed something new. And so we suddenly, we put ourselves on the course to have the kind of military that we think of, uh, think of uh, that we uh, think of today. Um, the other way that it changed the American military is sort of related to this, but, uh, but is also very striking. Um, one of the reasons we had such a small military was that it, it wasn't just a theoretical belief that a small army is a good army. Uh, but it was a very, particularly after the Civil War, a, a strong, uh, really passionate anti-militarism in the United States. Uh, it, it's striking to look back at some of the ways that people talked about what it meant to be a soldier, uh, what it meant to be in the army, what, it, what the army meant for the country. The army was seen as a parasite. It wasn't just a necessary evil, it was a parasite. And it was a dangerous uh, function that many politicians tried to get rid of completely. There were multiple bills through the 1870s and 80s calling for the complete abolition of the US Army and the belief that we are a country that no longer has uh, violent borders, we've more or less resolved our internal problems, uh, we can rely on the states and state militias and they'll take care of it. Anything else is a danger to American liberty. Uh, this was particularly uh, a particularly uh, pervasive idea in the South, for obvious reasons, but even through through the North, and it had a parallel in uh, the business in the business sector. Uh, it's not for nothing that I believe your neighbors are the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, Carnegie himself was a leader of the business pacifist movement and the belief that in every way, having a strong military is bad for business. Uh, it is expensive. It is uh, in a way in for a large state that will have all kinds of knock-on effects in terms of regulatory influence, all the things that a business leader would not like. Uh, but also, a military will be used to start wars, and wars are terrible uh, for business reasons. They're bad for business, right? And so Carnegie, I think very forthrightly, believed that the way forward was international peace, that the world was getting to a place where at least between uh, the United States and Europe and maybe a few other, maybe Japan, a few other countries, uh, these, we, can, we can agree to create a structure of international peace and we can put war behind us. And domestically, uh, the, the adjunct to that was, let's get rid of as much of the military as we can. And, and when we have the military, we'll sort of stick it out in these outposts at a, sort of a smaller level, to be in the military, or a smaller level, at a more personal level, uh, to be a soldier was to be an embarrassment to your family. Uh, you were either a West Point martinet, uh, who kind of, and most West Pointers came from middle class and upper class ranks, 
uh, you were seen as, well, you failed, right? You cannot do what your brothers and sisters are doing. Uh, they went off and they became lawyers and bankers and whatever, uh, or teachers. Uh, you're a soldier. And, and if you were, a concert, if you were a, uh, an enlistee, you were one step up from being a convict, right? That people would say, well, at least, thank God, we have the military so that these guys, who would otherwise be convicts uh, or, and felons, have some place to go. But let's make sure we never actually see them. So uh, many towns out west had sundown laws specifically regarding soldiers. So they could be in town during the day, but at night, they all had to go back to their garrison. A lot of states had, uh, had uh, they disenfranchised soldiers. So if you were, say, from Virginia and you were serving in Wyoming, you could not vote in Wyoming. Uh, and there was really no absentee ballot system. So soldiers were, by and large, uh, disenfranchised. And this was uh, a widespread, pervasive attitude. So all of this comes together to create this. Oh, and one other thing is just the, uh, the, the kind of the hangover from the Civil War. Uh, certainly the older generation, the generation of, sort of Roosevelt's parents' generation, looked at the war, looked at the Civil War, and said, we will never do this again. And so many of the leadership, so much of the leadership class, particularly the political leadership class, through the Gilded Age, was made up of men who had served in the war. Every president from Grant to McKinley had served in the war. And a lot of them, like Garfield, uh, had really st built their careers around having been Civil War uh, heroes. McKinley himself had uh, been, was a decorated officer from the Civil War. And yet, for them, war was an anathema to everything that they saw as, uh, as sort of public life in America, that it was the, the thing they had to make sure never happened again. So all of this came together uh, to make us, from Roosevelt's perspective, uh, incredibly unready to fight a war. And yet one of the things, and I think this is what the Rough Rider story in particular brings home, is one of the things that the war did uh, was to put us on a different course in terms of our civil military relations, in terms of the idea about what American soldiers were and what the role of the military could be. Uh, the war in Cuba for a lot of people, certainly not for everybody, uh, but for a lot of people was a humanitarian war. People watched the Spanish fight the Cuban uh, rebels. It had been a three-year war uh, at the point where America intervened. Hundreds of thousands of people had been killed. Spanish committed uh, extensive atrocities crimes against humanity in, uh, in Cuba. It was the first sort of documented widespread use of concentration camps. And Americans were motivated to go do something about it. And so when you had million, ultimately a million men volunteered to fight in the Spanish-American War, uh, you had this outpouring of uh, volunteerism to go fight. But you had all of that sort of, uh, sort of symbolized and, and sort of uh, brought together in the story of the Rough Riders, I was struck by how often journalists wrote about the Rough Riders as the emblem of what a good army is, right? That here are men who have careers, who have lives, and they are going off and they're coming from all different parts of, all different walks of life. They're rich kids, cowboys, whatever, going off to war with no other ideal than to uh, bring liberty to the Cubans that's what we can do with a military. That's what the American military does, and it's what sets us apart. So that after the war, when the American government, when the federal government started to say, no, we're never going to go back to what we had. We're going to have a larger military. We're going to professionalize it and really take it seriously. The public was very much behind that idea because they had this idea that the military, they, they, this revolution idea at the time, revolutionary idea at the time, uh, and one that today is so so much a part of our identity and how we think about the army that it's hard to imagine it ever not being there. But it was wholly new at the time, this idea that the American military is a force for good in the world and that, therefore, it is a good thing to serve in the military. And the people who serve in the military are there for ideals, not simply because they couldn't find anything better uh, to do with their lives. And, and it's it's. Very striking, and of course, the, the the standing of the American Army and the military in general waxes and wanes throughout the 20th century. And I don't want to say that everything changed for forever after that. But one of the things that's very striking, and, I, and I'll leave it at this, and we'll go to questions. One of the things that's very striking is how quickly the public attitudes about 
war and about what it meant to serve in a war and what the possibilities of American power were after the Spanish-American War, uh, I think it's, when, when, when Sam asked, why do we need to remember this war, I think that more than anything is why we need to remember it. Because all the things that America was able to achieve, uh, for better or worse, whatever your position is on sort of American power through the 20th century, but whatever we were able to achieve it was only achievable because of the things that we put in place and the attitudes that we adopted during and after the Spanish-American War. So with that, I will uh, go to questions. Sounds great. So uh, we have a nice group. So we have some time. Um, and I'll say your hand first. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Paul Wolfowitz. Um, my Marine friends would say, this guy sounds like a Marine, not one of those army, uh, whatever they would say, leading from the front and letting the troops eat it before they do all of that stuff. At any rate, and somebody mentioned Mattis, I think, or Sam did. Um, two sort of historical curiosity questions, and then one more fundamental one. The curiosity questions are number one, I believe Roosevelt was the only American president to receive the... To, Congressional Medal of Honor, and the only person in history to receive both the Congressional Medal of Honor and the Nobel Peace Prize. Is there anything you would want to draw out of that combination? Um, it's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I, I think it just goes to uh, the, well, actually, one of the curiosities of that is he really wanted the Congressional Medal of Honor, uh, and it was to him the capstone of his experience in, in that war. And to, and to the end of his life, he, he fought for it. And it was only in 2002, I believe, that uh, he received it. Um, and yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so, but he wanted it so badly. Uh, he didn't really go after the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, and, and it's not because he didn't want it. But I think that, you know, as I was speaking earlier about kind of the evolution of his thinking, um, so much of what he did, and he won the prize, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize, for uh, bringing this uh, Russo-Japanese War to an end in 1905. So much of that was, I think, part of what he just saw his role as president being, and, uh, and part of his kind of bigger vision for what America could do, kind of to you know, arbitrate uh, peace in the world. And... You know, when he received the prize, of course he was proud, and, uh, but it, it took him a long time. He only received the, went to receive the prize. Of course, it was harder uh, to get to Europe, uh, to get to Sweden, then than it is now. But he only received it in, uh, in, eight, in 1909 after he uh, uh, left the presidency. But, but I, I guess that's the only thing I would say is just, um, you know, that the, the, they represented two very different things to him. And I think represent very different moments in his life uh, for him. That kind of uh, capstone to an earlier part of his life and uh, an award for being kind of a world statesman. And they're very different Roosevelt's. Well, maybe these, I've, since I've got the microphone, I'm going to keep going if you don't mind. Um, <laughs> we can fight for it. But um, the other curiosity, I think, is that for a large part of the 19th century, I guess before the Civil War, the South wanted to invade Cuba to bring in another slave state. Uh, did that play any role in, in, in 1898 at all? Um, yeah, yeah, actually it was, um, it ended up, uh, it, for, this, for, for all the reasons why before the Civil War, the South wanted to bring in Cuba as a slave state, after the Civil War, the South did not want to invade Cuba. Uh, there were multiple moments during the post-Civil War, during the late 19th century when, uh, I guess especially under, under Grant, it kind of died off after that, where there were efforts uh, to buy Cuba uh, from, from Spain and negotiate some kind of either a protectorate or some relationship between the United States. And the South was very wary of that because uh, it would mean bringing in uh, a state full of you know, free, free blacks and people of color. And, um, and so that's what they didn't want, right? Uh, for the same, it sort of mirror, it flipped. It was why in, uh, before the Civil War, 
most people in the, in the North did not want anything to do with Cuba because it would mean bringing in uh, another slave state. Uh, now, all of a sudden, the, the, the tables were turned. Um, but even up until 1898, there was strong opposition, uh, not just to the war on the grounds of it would mean building up a big military, but there was strong opposition to, uh, to going into Cuba specifically uh, because it might lead to something like that. One last one, then I'll be yeah, a gentleman and give up the microphone. <laughs> um, you mentioned that in some ways Cuba was a war of liberation by the United States, but what followed in the Philippines was the exact opposite. We behaved very much like the Spaniards had in, the Phil in, the, in Cuba. Uh, how do you connect those two, and, or how did Roosevelt connect those two? Um, he was still alive and even president, right? Yeah, now. well, it's interesting. So, you know, Cuba was uh, as badly prepared, as ill prepared as the United States was to. Uh, fight the war, uh, we actually did a pretty good job in terms of as an occupation force in Cuba. Uh, Leonard Wood, who had been the first command, he was the first colonel in charge of the Rough Riders. Uh, Roosevelt started off as the uh, lieutenant colonel. Wood was then promoted during the campaign and Roosevelt took over. Wood ended up being uh, in charge of uh, reconstruction, as it were, uh, in Cuba. And and did a really good job, imported all kinds of progressive, good government ideas, and uh, there's some good literature on um, Cuba as kind of a test, particularly Havana itself, as, as kind of a test bed for progressive ideas uh, during, and it's not that long of a period, a couple of years uh, before the United States left. Um, that was also, and Puerto Rico as well. I mean, we forget that Puerto Rico was, was occupied, uh, was conquered by the United States during this conflict. Uh, Puerto Rico was also a test bed for those ideas. The Philippines was, was, was never intended. We never wanted to take the Philippines the way we did. Um, you know, it was uh, incidental uh, after we defeated. Like I said, the Spanish were, were argu arguably looking for reasons to give up their empire. And as soon as Dewey defeated the Spanish fleet in Manila, the, the Spanish more or less uh, vacated the Philippines. And for geopolitical reasons, the United States couldn't just the United States felt, we can't just give the Philippines to the Filipinos, I and mean, there were racial reasons as well. Uh, but the Germans were looking hungrily across the South, Southeast or South Pacific uh, for territory. And so we were very concerned immediately that if we leave, the Germans will take over. And then one thing led to the other, and it's, it's, it's funny to look at these two, and, and one thing led to the other, the Filipinos who welcomed us as liberators suddenly said, wait, these guys aren't here to liberate us. Uh, we're going to pick our guns back up because we are fighting the Spanish, and here we go. And as you said, you know, we ended up doing many of the terrible things that the Spanish had done uh, in Cuba uh, to the Filipinos. And you know, Roosevelt at first was adamantly in favor um, of occupying and fighting in the Philippines. Uh, by 1905, by his second administration, he was uh, he had really soured on it, but realized there was nothing. We couldn't just leave. Uh, felt that the bedrock reasons for being there were, were still strong, but really resent, regretted the fact that we were there and, and sort of saw it all as a very tragic turn. Um, and, and I think that's generally how the country felt. Uh, there was a strong anti-imperialist movement, uh, Mark Twain being kind of the, the headliner, uh, who's very, uh, very critical of the American occupation of the Philippines. But, I, but it also was kind of the, the end of America's, at least that period of uh, American colonialism. Um, you know, I, I think it, it's also, these two stories, you know, they, they echo through the 20th century and you can find um, similar situations and sort of similar mistakes and successes in American foreign policy, similar in some ways to Cuba, uh, similar in some way to the Philippines. And, you know, it's, I would say one of the tragedies is you know, that, that that kept happening. Um, but I think you take away uh, a couple of lessons, right? One is uh, in Cuba, we were prepared. In the Philippines, we were not. And um, we overextended ourselves. And that, that, uh, that I think is, again, something that, that, that recommends that period as a moment of reflection and continued relevance up through today. Uh, let's do one and two. <laughs> I don't know if we have time, we'll do three. Um, how much of Teddy's uh, 
desire for war being glory. Did you find being based on his dad having paid for a substitute to yeah. avoid fighting in the Civil War? And did his attitude on the glory of war change once his son died? Well, yeah. Uh, so I think it's certainly true that he uh, looked at his father's uh, purchase of a substitute uh, to avoid fighting in the Civil War as, as a shame. As a, not so much a sh I mean, it was a shame. He worshipped his father. And so it was more for him a complication. It was this sort of, I love my father as a god, and yet he did this thing that goes against what I, what I believe and what I think he believes. So throughout his life, he wrestled with that question. Um, you know, I think that his, ultimately that may have played a part in his desire for war. Um, there's a certain Freudian sort of story to tell. I think also it's just inextricable from kind of the, the deep morass of his personality, and it's hard to say, well, that comes from one thing or the other. You know, he was also driven by his father to be a, a very aggressive, hyper-masculine type. And they, he probably would have done that, whatever his father had done during the Civil War. So it's, it's hard to say, but it's not, not a factor, I guess. Uh, his, so his son, so his son Quentin, uh, he had encouraged all of his sons uh, to go off and join World War I. Uh, his son Quentin uh, was his youngest son, uh, was kind of the apple of his eye. Uh, and he um, had joined uh, the Air Corps. He was shot down, died. Photographs of his body were made public. It was a very personally difficult uh, experience for Roosevelt. It was especially difficult for his wife. Uh, his wife never really got over that, and I think Roosevelt, I think th this is what I think Roosevelt felt, and I can't say he didn't actually record. There's not much about his attitude about war. Um, publicly, he said, I'm glad this happened the way it did. Um, if my son had to die before I did, I'm glad he died in war, that kind of thing. Um, I think what hurt him the most was seeing how it hurt his wife and feeling that whatever, you know, whatever his attitudes were as a father and as a public figure and as an advocate for the war, uh, he felt very strong about that. And yet he saw that it destroyed his wife. And Seeing that, I think he never he never integrated that into his public view. He never said, "Now I've seen what this does to families, and so it changes my attitude." Um, that never happened. But personally, privately, I think that it uh, it definitely would have it definitely affected how he thought about war uh, on a personal level. the The complicating thing is that he then died soon afterward, so it's hard to know. And he was very sick. I mean, he was ailing. His body was giving out. And so, you know, what would he have said over time? How would he have, if he had lived another 10 years, how would his thinking about war have evolved uh, based on the experience? It's, it's hard to say. But I would say it probably, yeah, would have affected him. Thank you. Pete Kurtznauser from Great Falls. Uh, there are four faces on Mount Rushmore. What made his, less than a decade after his death, what made his contemporaries feel so strongly about him that he deserved to be in the pantheon of Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln? Well, one, one thing was he was best friends with the artist. <laughs> uh, and, 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 you know, he, uh, Roosevelt was a great patron of the arts, by the way. I mean, he, uh, uh, you know, there were, there were multiple artists that, sort of starving artists that he, uh, including Edward Arlington Robinson, who he, whose poetry he admired greatly, who is a struggling artist, didn't have a job in New York. Roosevelt arranged for him to get kind of a sinecure on the federal payroll. Didn't have to work, really. He just wanted him to write poetry. But anyway, that's a side note. Um, Roosevelt stood, you know, look, first of all, the 20th century had not happened. So, you know, Americans are looking back over a much briefer period, and who are the great four great presidents? Well, Roosevelt was pretty amazing, uh, especially given that after Lincoln, there's not much. You know, it's, it's like, I mean, how many people can name all the presidents even? And most of them are forgotten for good reason. Um, you know, recently there's been a resurgence in, uh, uh, in McKinley's stature. People are saying, oh, yeah, McKinley's pretty good. Grant as well. But generally speaking, the public at the time looked back and said, you know what? Before Roosevelt, there's not much. And after Roosevelt, uh, Wilson was not very popular. 
uh, at the time. Uh, Taft certainly was not. I mean, there were just, so there just weren't options. So I think all of that comes together to say, was that? Eh, you know, no, but no, I, I, I think it's not just we had to find a fourth, so Roosevelt. I think Roosevelt stands t even taller than he would have otherwise because of all these around him. But in and of himself, he was understood at the time to have redefined the presidency and to have put America in a certain direction. I mean, Roosevelt was the, f again, it's, it's hard to compare him to presidents of other eras, but certainly for the public, they had never, no one alive, except those who could remember Lincoln to some extent, uh, no one alive had, been, had, had had a president who, who occupied the public space in any way close to what Roosevelt did. You know, this is a guy who, even if he hadn't been president, would have been world famous because as a writer, as, uh, as an adventurer, as sort of a public speaker, and he brought all of that to his role as president. And he, he recreated not just what the federal government did, but what the presidency meant. And people understood that at the time. So, you know, here's this guy who probably at the time felt world historical, whether you liked him or not, whether you approved of his policies. Here's a guy who has just revolutionized the, what it meant to be uh, at the top of the executive branch. So there was a very strong positive argument for putting Roosevelt on, on Mount Rushmore. And I think, you know, still is. Let's do the final question here as best as we can since I don't want to keep everyone too, yeah. too long. Yeah, I, w I went to a, a recent talk by Admiral Stavridis, mm -hmm. and he uh, said that recent, recent analysis of the main uh, wreckage is that it was an internal destruction and not by the Spanish. Mm -hmm. If that had been known, would that have changed anything? I don't think so. Um, I mean, the, the main, uh, so, so as, as you probably know, so the main cruiser sent to Havana Harbor uh, as a show of force. Uh, McKinley was doing everything he could to get Spain to leave Cuba peacefully. And so there were negotiations going on throughout early 1898. And we sent the main as just to kind of say, hey, we have a big ship. Uh, and so, and then in February, uh, February 15th, uh, it exploded. And so one, you know, on that night, it was the worst naval disaster up to that time in American history. And even at the moment, uh, people believed, uh, a large number, a large amount of the public believed it was an accident. Uh, no one could conceive, and when you think about it, it's still true, why would the Spanish do that? We weren't at war with them. They were... Uh, we were in negotiations. So a lot, of, and a lot of people said that, uh, including Roosevelt's boss, uh, John Long, who was the Secretary of the Navy. He said, look, the Spanish, no, no incentive to do this. They're helping us, and it's true. Right away, the Spanish sent rescue ships out to pick up men. They facilitated and, you know, and cooperated on the initial investigation. Um, but there was a naval court of inquiry, and, and it was uh, found that, yes, it was probably an external explosion. Even then, the conclusion was uh, it wasn't an attack by the Spanish. It was maybe a, a mine that was floating. They had forgotten about it. It exploded. And so it was really just kind of this background, uh, you know, background disaster that made the war uh, more likely but didn't make it happen. Now, so to your question, in the 1870s, uh, Hyman Rickover, who among other things, was the father of the nuclear navy. Uh, Admiral Hyman Rickover uh, was uh, nearing retirement, and he was given the task of settling once and for all what had happened to the Maine. And he did, uh, they did a very extensive analysis to the extent that they could get to uh, the remains of the Maine. Uh, they uh, examined those, and they concluded uh, also large, a lot of circumstantial research into what happened you know, similar incidents with other ships. And what they found was that cruiser design in particular had a, a, a fatal flaw, and it was that there, was, there were several places in the forward hold, or in the forward part of the ship, uh, that were liable to uh, set off sparks, a variety of some equipment, things like that. And it was very close to uh, a, a forward ammunition hold. And so, and, and the ammunition at the time was not very, it was, wasn't a sterile environment. Uh, you had gunpowder all over, you know, sort of dust in the air. It was very liable to have, uh, you know, essentially spontaneous combustion. A spark sets off the dust. It's not 
it's right there with all this. And that's exactly what happened is there was, uh, as far as Rickover concluded, there was an explosion and it was inside and that's what sank the main. So, and that's pretty much, I mean, that was in the 1970s and that's pretty, no one has ever uh, undercut Rickover's conclusion since then. So. And final thing, right. what did they drink? While they were out there, as what did they drink? Expert on spirits. No, they did not drink whiskey. Um, they so two fun things. Uh, well, one really is uh, so the there was a lot of rum. So there was okay. a lot of rum drinking. Uh, this is Cuba. Uh, there was uh, the first place where they landed was Daiquiri Beach. Um, <laughs> the daiquiri was invented in Santiago, uh, based on you know men down there, it was, it's, it's not known was it a civilian or uh, an American soldier who actually said, hey, this rum is good, we'd really love it on ice with some sugar and some citrus, <laughs> and could you do that? Uh, but but that, was, that was invented, it was called the daiquiri after the site of the first landing. Um, if you go to the Army Navy Club here, uh, there is a plaque uh, detailing this, uh, talking about, and I think it's actually, the bar there, one of the bars, is unofficially called the Daiquiri Bar. And it's uh, named after the story that the army invented the Daiquiri uh, based on that experience. Um, if you go to Santiago, which I did for research for the book, uh, Santiagoans in Cuba uh, resent the heck out of the fact that Havana and Ernest Hemingway stole the Daiquiri. Right? So if you go to Havana, uh, Havana has all these bars that say, oh, we're the home of the daiquiri, we invented the daiquiri. And if you go to Santiago, bartenders and just, I mean, the general public attitude is, no. <laughs> no, we invented it, that's ours, and please come drink our drinks because they're so much better. Um, I recommend it. Santiago's awesome, by the way, uh, if you ever have a chance to go. And on that note, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Clay. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. And please pick up a copy of his book when you can. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you.